So our first speaker uh, is Stephen Eubank, who's a professor at the Virginia Bioinformatics Institute. Uh, he's also deputy director of the Network Dynamics and Simulation Science Lab, NDSSL, another of those abbreviations you hear. Uh, he's an, also an adjunct professor in the Department of Physics and an affiliate of Population Health Sciences and, and Veterinary Medicine. Uh, he has his BA in Physics from Sport Fork College and a PhD in Physics from the University of Texas at Austin. And he did postdocs at La Jolla Institute studying fluid turbulence and Los Alamos National Lab studying nonlinear dynamics. And so you can see, and I think you notice this perhaps as we introduce people coming into these interdisciplinary areas, they really do come from a lot of different areas. Uh, and yet ultimately, in this case, studying computational immunology. Uh, his research interests are in simulating large socio-technical systems, computational epidemiology, scaling and complex systems, network structure graph theory, among other things. So the title of this talk is The Use of an EC in the Context of Agent-Based Modeling and High-Performance Computing. Thanks. Thank you. So um, yesterday, I know Dave gave a, a great introduction to modeling, the uses of modeling, and even some of what agent-based modeling is all about. And today I'm going to amplify on those and give you some illustrations of the kinds of concerns and issues that arise when you apply these kinds of models to immunology. Um, so to start with, although we've heard one take on what a model is, I'm going to give you another take on what a model is. Uh, I went to the dictionary to look up definitions of models. This is not the kind of model that we're, we're particularly interested in. Uh, this is also not the kind of model that we're particularly interested in. I had to go down to number 10 to get a simplified representation of a system or phenomenon, as in the sciences. Now this is the, uh, the famous mouse model. Um, parts, of, parts of our program here are interested in the, the mouse model or the pig models. But I'm going to talk today about mathematical models, which is fortunately in the definition in that dictionary. And the graph here is absolutely meaningless. It's just a, a portrayal of something that looks vaguely mathematical. So that when I point to that figure, you'll know that I'm talking about mathematical representation of uh, a system or phenomenon. But even this isn't specific enough. Because there's, there, are, there are two kinds of models out there. And it's often very difficult to distinguish between them. And it leads to lots of confusion. So I'm going, to, I'm going to make one more distinction in what I mean by model. Um, some models that you look at are representations of data. So they, they tell you about the correlations in a, a set of data that you have. Maybe you've done some exper experiments and you notice that concentrations of T cells in a particular organ are, are increasing, uh, similar to the way, I don't know, some invasive bacteria is increasing. It's just a relationship between observations you've made in the data set. There's another kind of model that can look, it can give you the same kinds of results, oddly enough, but it's a causal, explanatory model of what's happening in the system. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Whenever I use the word model, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So it's a mathematical model that tries to explain some sort of observed behavior. And if you're lucky enough, you can explain the, the behavior that, that that first type of model, the correlative kind of model, uh, gives you pictures of. Right. So not that one. Now, um, I'm, I'm a, uh, an advocate, I guess, of agent-based modeling. Uh, but I, I don't see it as something completely separate from the long tradition of models. But I'll tell you that agent-based models have have created a real revolution in, in the world of modeling. So traditionally, what we've had are things like coupled rate equations, ordinary differential equations, models of concentrations in a chemical system, say, or, or uh, compartments in an epidemiological model, or counts of different kinds of cells in, uh, in the body somewhere. And the kinds of things these models focused on were nonlinear responses where things get small differences get amplified. Um, those are very closely related to phase transitions in a system where it goes from having one kind of behavior to having a different, completely different kind of behavior. And what you get are results like these, typically these nice smooth curves that, that uh, 
tell you something about population level dynamics in the system. What we're looking at now, though, are the ways that individual things in the system change, what the dynamics look like. So this is an example of a, a movie generated using um, an agent-based model, NEC, which is the Interior Community Simulator, uh, developed in our program. And what I'm going to try to explain today is what it takes to make a model like that. It's really fairly easy, although getting it calibrated to what you want to study is, is a trick. Um, and also where these the differences between the kinds of results you get out of these models and, and the traditional ones. So what is an agent-based model? Dave went through this pretty well yesterday, and I'm just going to reinforce some of the things he said. So agent-based models, you have to have something that's going to be the agent. That thing has a state, and it interacts with other things in a very mathematically well-specified way. And by interact, I don't mean some sort of vague two things interact. I mean that the state of one thing changes the state of another thing. That's what an interaction is. So uh, let me tease this definition apart quite a bit. So we're going to start with things. They can be anything you want. You're the modeler. You get to choose what you're going to model. You might want to model individual entities like cells, or you might want to model uh, collections of entities as in a population of cells. You might want to model at different scales, like molecules, or cells, or organs, or humans. And we're going to have just a list of these things, E1 through EN. There'll be N of them. Uh, the things have states. And this is a sort of a analogy to parts of speech that I've got going here. So the states are like adjectives. They describe the nouns. Um, and this table Dave showed yesterday, which is uh, a table of some of the states that the things in our NEC model can be in. Um, typically, or certainly for a computer model, you'll want a finite set of these states. Uh, they can be continuous states or discrete states, so like an, an object might have a temperature associated with it, which would be a continuous variable, or it could be discrete, like does it express IL-17 or not? Um, typically the states, or the individuals can have parameterized values for these states. So uh, that there may be a, instead of describing the entire cell output, for example, you might say, well, uh, this cell is primarily expressing one particular IL. Um, so we'll represent the state of the, of the whole system as a collection of states for each for each individual entity there. And the states interact. So if I've got the state of, of thing number one at time t plus one, it depends on what the state of some set of things was at time t. Um, the, the trick here is knowing what what is this set of other things that its state depends on? What does it interact with? And typically, especially in, a, in an immunological model, it's going to interact with things that are near it. Um, this isn't always the case in every kind of model, but uh, if you've got two cells that are near each other, they're the ones that are having the most influence on each other. So one of the things that you want to know about that uh, set of things that they interact with is does it stay the same all the time, or does it change? Are the cells moving around? Are the molecules being uh, churned up in some sort of chemical soup inside a cell? Uh, is, the net, oh, sorry, is it a static or dynamic network of interactions? And then what is it that makes it dynamic? If the cells are moving, is it just the sort of Brownian motion, they're bumping into each other a lot, or, or is there some actual chemotaxis going on? That, is drawing cells in a particular direction. And finally, stretching the metaphor a little bit much, uh, the mathematical rule is, is like a, an adverb. It tells you how the things interact. 
Uh, so again, you've got choices when you define your mathematical rule. Mostly I'll be talking about stochastic models here, in which the rule takes the form of, given the states of all these things at time t, that determines some sort of probability distribution of what the state of each thing is going to be at time t plus 1. And this is a, a Markov process, if you've, if you've heard of that. Uh, if, it were a, if it were a deterministic model, this function would instead tell you exactly what the state of time t plus 1 is going to be for that element. I'm also going to talk about things that are discrete in time. So over here I've got time t, and over there I've got time t plus 1. I can make the, the time step as small or as large as I want, uh, and it, it changes the complications of the, the function after a So, um, the thing that's particularly novel, you have to specify all those things no matter what kind of model you're building. You, you need to, to say what it is that you're representing in your model and how it interacts with, with everything. So all that is very traditional kind of model. It's this interaction network that is pretty much specific to agent-based models. So if each of, these, each of these things in the system is represented as a vertex, and every interaction is represented as an edge, then what I need to know is this network of, of interactions. As the network changes, uh, the, the, the set of things that one cell is interacting with changes. And the states that the cells are in themselves can change the way the network is structured. So this is for a general agent-based model. Let's look at what it might look like for uh, an agent-based model for the immune system. Like I was saying, you can, you can choose cells to be the things that are, are interacting. And you can choose uh, cytokine-mediated interactions to, to be what these edges are representing. So that then what the interactions do is they, they change the cell state and uh, they can change the network itself and all that together produces the dynamics of the immune system if you've got everything parameters right. Parameters right and the interaction rules right and the things calibrated. <laughs> so, very easy, all right? Set and done. Um, and it's not just that we have a model that represents the way things are operating right now, and that's all it can ever represent. Because we have a causal explanatory sort of model, we can represent things like uh, changing, changing parts of the system. So I can build a, a knockout animal, I can represent what that knockout does in terms of the, of the uh, agent-based model. Maybe it changes the, the states of some of the cells. It changes what their interactions can be like. Um, I can prime some of the cells with, with antigen, and maybe it changes the way they interact, changes the states that they're in. I can regulate expression. Anything that you can imagine doing in your experimental setup, I can do to the model that I have representing it, as long as the model is sufficiently powerful. Um, all these kinds of things. Also, there's no notion of, of scale in the system. So I can represent all kinds of different systems. The one, the one that we're going to be talking about in EC as applied to H. pylori infection represents these kinds of things. The, the interleukins, the macrophages, the, the T cells, and the bacteria themselves. But I could just as easily uh, represent molecular dynamics this way. Which molecules are interacting with, with which other molecules. The interaction there would be some sort of chemical binding affinity. I could also represent uh, infectious disease with this kind of model, where the, the, uh, the, the individual things would be humans or maybe vectors, if it's a vector-borne disease, or animal uh, reservoirs. And the interactions would be basically transmitting infectious disease. So one, one of the reasons I bring this up is that you can, you can cross scales with a model like this. So I might have a model that's uh, molecular and a model that's cellular and a model that's, that's population level, human population level, and be able to, to put them all together because they're built in very similar ways. So this topic will come up during the week as, as multi-scale models. Um, 
and of course there's nothing that restricts me from adding uh, continuous fields to this as well. So uh, I can take a, a hybrid, can generate a hybrid model that takes discrete agents that I've been talking about and lets them interact with continuous fields. So for example, I have discrete cells in my model and they secrete cytokines into their environment. And the environment is just a local part of space that they happen to be sitting in. We can keep count, we can keep track of how much cytokine is in the environment, what the concentration is. So we have a kind of ODE representation of the cytokines and a discrete representation of the cells, and we can put them together. Similarly, in fact, we, we do this, or at least we did in, in earliest versions of MMC. We don't really care what's going on with H. pylori in the gut unless it's starting to attack the, the epithelial layers. So we can just look at the population dynamics, if we wanted to, of, of uh, H. pylori in the gut. And then when we decide that there's so much H. pylori there that it's starting to, to uh, attack the epithelium, then we can turn that into an individual agent-based model. So there's, a, there's other ways of combining these models at different scales and, and uh, levels of representation together. Um, so I've kind of hinted at this. Let's, let's take a different look at this. Instead of looking just at the network, this is a, a patch of space, a volume of space. And we've split it up into little grid cells. And in each of these cells, there are either are or are not some things. And each one of those things is one of the class of things that we've defined would be in our model. So in particular, uh, We'll have the host cells and the bacteria be the agents that are represented in here. Each agent is represented as an automaton. That just means it has a series of states and rules for transitioning from one state to another based on its interactions with other, other agents. The agents are free to move around in a couple of well-defined locations in our model, particularly the gut mucosa and the lymph node. Things that are nearby are in contact. So in our case, things that are in the same one, these little cells are in contact. And then all the interaction rules come into play. And the interaction rules can be just, if this is in contact with that, do something. Or it can be, if this is in contact with all these things, do something else, change the state in a different way. Um, and EC itself allows you to script all these interactions and all the kinds of things you're doing and what interventions you're applying in your scenario. It's, it's uh, probably not something that the casual user would want to ever do. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we describe the model, how we try to communicate, how you would use it and stuff. So this is a, a static picture of all the possible kinds of interactions in that model. And I, if this doesn't do it justice at all. Um, if I were you, I would go to this website and pick the modeling menu and the host responses to H. pylori and the ABM model. Because, and I can't really show it to you at this screen resolution without messing up my laptop a lot. Um, but what you can do online is click on any one of these um, There'll be place marks online, like a like a Google map or something. You can click on the place mark to get a description of what's going on, what what that thing represents, what kind of interactions it has, and uh, I, I believe you'll see this afternoon that you can tie this to a particular experimental run. If you've done that, you can click on there and you'll see the the concentrations of that kind of cell across time during the experimental run. Uh, similarly, you can look at the, the entire location. So, given that you can, you can do all that dynamically online, let me just tell you what, what this is representing. These are four different places in the body, and you probably can't read it. It says, uh, I can't either. It says lumen, and uh, epithelium, lamina propria, and uh, gastric lymph node at the bottom. So, there are these 
different things. They can, they can appear in the, any of these different places within the body. And their interactions may depend on where they are in the body. Um, and you probably also can't read what's written in these columns. So there are, there are basically the dendritic cells, the T cells, the bacteria, um, and their macrophages. And there are different types of macrophages. And that's about the extent of my knowledge of immunology. You heard my introduction. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to answer questions from them. But I can tell you that uh, the interactions are mathematically well defined and they're parameterized. And I'll show you a little bit about the parameters in a second. All right. here's, a, here's a little bit clearer view of the, uh, of the uh, laminar appropriate um, model. And I should, I should remind you that, especially if you're used to looking at these cell designer models, this, this doesn't mean that in our model there's just one of these things. There could be lots and lots of these things in the laminar appropriate in our, in our simulation at any one time. It's just, this is just telling you that for each one of those, it has certain ways of interacting with all the other things within the laminar appropriate. And that grid that I showed you earlier defines how, uh, which other things it's going to interact with. So, uh, here's another picture of the interactions themselves. And the point I want to make here is that each one of these lines, so here's something that tells you a rate at which uh, type 1 macrophages might change into type 2 macrophages. Uh, and how a, a naive macrophage might or in either one of those. Each one of these interactions is parameterized by the parameters sitting in these boxes here. And if you stop to think about it, you'll say, that's an awful lot of parameters for a model. Because essentially you're going to try to calibrate those parameters by looking at the results of experiments. And each experiment is only going to give you a few values that you can calibrate with. So, Sometimes, particularly when it's displayed this way, people say, my gosh, there's an awful lot of parameters in, in your agent-based model. I can't possibly trust it. I, I go back to my <coughs> Statistics 1 class and say, there's not enough data to calibrate all those parameters. But I want to argue that this is, this is a consequence of systems modeling. If you're trying to model the entire system, somehow or other, you're going to have to represent each of the different components of the system, and you're going to have to represent the interactions each one has with, with each other one. So the art here is to, to understand how you can prune this interaction network without dramatically changing the, the eventual consequences. If your goal is to reduce the number of parameters, um, that's something that has to be done at the stage where you decide how many things, how many different kinds of things are going to be in your model. Because if you have n things in the model, then there's n squared possible interactions that could be happening. And they'll essentially be a parameter associated with each one of those interactions. So, we throw all this together, we start it off, we start off the simulation with some initial conditions, and what we find well, basically, we find the movie that I showed you in the first case. But given that kind of detailed uh, representation of each individual cell and, and uh, in the model and where they are, you can always aggregate back up to get the concentrations that you might be more familiar with working with. So you could get these kinds of results, the, the, uh, the time course of concentrations of different kinds of cells uh, by location in the body if you want, or by, uh, uh, by aggregate. The only way to, so the, the next step in this modeling process is to figure out what those curves that come out of simulation have to do with reality at all. And the only way to do that is to go to experiment and calibrate the parameters in your model so that you can reproduce the experiments at, at the very least. And this is an example of uh, sources we've used to derive calibrations for our model. Um, one thing that's not clear from, from this is that you don't usually look up an article and find, here's the value for the parameter you need in your model. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. So in, in practice, what we've done to calibrate the agent-based model that we found works rather well is to go to 
something like a Kapasi model, in which everything that we've got represented here is, is in that Kapasi model somewhere. It's just not done in an individual cell level representation. So if we can get the Kapasi model calibrated pretty well, we can use that as a starting point for a search in the space of parameters for the agent-based model. This is one, one direction of the cycle of experiment and modeling that goes on in a, in a research project like this. So this is the direction that says experiments help you calibrate the models that you're using. I'll get to the other direction in a few minutes. So like I said, Anisi itself is something that probably only a uh, model developer could love. And the interface to it, uh, the simplified interface to it, Right, this is scripting interface that you really probably don't want to look at. Um, we extracted from those scripts some sort of standard scenarios, standard uh, interactions that we think are applicable to a large variety of, of uh, questions you might have. And we let the user go in and type values for like initial conditions, how many of different species you want to, to be representing and modeling. Uh, what kind of, of uh, perturbation you're going to apply, and how long, what the time force is that you're, you're studying. And you hit the button, it goes off and runs on a big cluster computer somewhere, and the answers come back in the form of these kinds of curves, time forces of, of different concentrations. And like I say, I can't tell you what the biological meaning of, of all this really is. So that's why we have a collaboration in this group. Um, there is a, a rather nicer interface to the essentially the same system that we will be working with this afternoon. And I'll, uh, I will let Adria tell you how to, how to use that. Yes, I think he says it's okay. <laughs> all right, so now suppose Suppose you've built your ABM. I want to do. I want to tell you a little bit more about how you're going to use it. You've got this thing. You can set the parameter. You can calibrate the parameters. You know what it represents. You can change the particular scenario you're looking at, and you get curves coming out. Um, what do those curves really mean? What, what's it computing? So. Um, these interactions. If you think about interaction network. Uh, and you think about the state of one of the cells in that interaction network as it goes through time. The more it interacts with other things, the more its state is related to the states of all the other things it interacts with. And because those are, in turn, interacting with other things, yet other things, uh, eventually that whole network becomes one big correlated system. And what you're, what you're getting from your simulation is one path through all the possible sets of correlations. Because it's a probabilistic system, it just tells you this particular path that I'm simulating, the state of the system at, at time t is this. Um, how much, how, one of the things that computer scientists are really good at is counting. And I don't say that as demeaning in any way. It's hard to count things sometimes. So let's, let's count. How many numbers would it take to describe the system, the state of the entire system? If there are n objects, and each one, let's say for simplicity, has exactly k states it can be in, then it takes k times n numbers to describe the state of the system. That's not too bad. Unfortunately, you're just following one path through this enormous state space, probabilistic state space. So in any one run, you're just taking a sample from the joint distribution of all possible states at time t. So down here, instead of, instead of just having one particular state at time t, we've got uh, the probability of it being in any one of these particular states at time t. Right? If it takes kn numbers to describe the single configuration, it takes k raised to the power n numbers to describe this probability distribution. And if you're not really used to working with exponents, that might not seem like a bad thing. But it has a serious consequence. 
it's, it's absolutely impossible to describe the joint distribution of a system of any particular size, any size greater than 20, 30. So for example, here's a, here's a partial description of a probability distribution of just three possible states, we will call light, inflammatory, and regulatory, over uh, five, five cells. And what I'm, what I'm talking about when I say a, describing a probability distribution is a listing of all the possible configurations and a probability associated with each one. And to do that for five cells with three states would take about one and a half petabytes. <coughs> and that's just one point in time. So this clearly we're not going to do this. Instead, we're going to have to reduce that big probability distribution down to simpler numbers. So we went to all this effort to take a, a sort of population level description of the system and break it down into what's happening to all the individuals. And now I'm telling you that at the, at the end of everything, we're going to ignore the individuals and aggregate back up to the sort of population level description. And I'll, I'll explain in a while why it's important to do that. It's not as crazy as it sounds. What happens is, instead of, so instead of, uh, estimating the entire joint distribution, we draw samples and we use those to calculate statistics on the joint distribution, like the correlation between the states of this thing and that thing, or uh, the, the, the mean value of the concentration as a function of time, something like that. And in order to do this, you have to draw more than one sample. Just doing one run is not sufficient. And I can't tell you ahead of time how many runs you need to do but I can't tell you it's more than one. In order to be able to do lots of runs and to be able to work with a big system, we have to be able to compute efficiently. So that's why Joseph has asked uh, computer scientists, software engineers to, to work on this project together. It's a collaborative effort to build systems that will support the kinds of modeling he needs to do. So. Um, I described one view of the different kinds of models. Now, there's, there's this really unfortunate thing that's going on in the literature that I would like to steer you guys away from, if, if at all possible, which is there's a camp of agent-based modelers, there's a camp of ODE modelers, there's a camp of any other kind of modelers. And it's just silly. The, one is saying that you can't do things with the other. So I'd like to walk through what some of the differences are in terms of this old story of the blind man and the elephant, right? Each blind person comes up, feels a different part of the elephant, and goes away with a different story of what the elephant is. So in particular, I'm thinking, I'll just talk about three different styles of modeling. Uh, one are the agent-based models, one of the ordinary differential equation models, and one is a kind of somewhere in between reaction diffusion style modeling. So the, the ODE models, they may start with the thinking of an interaction network, but they rapidly uh, aggregate over the interaction network. And they emphasize the aggregate population outcomes. And you can actually derive the ODE network from the, from the sorry, the ODE model from the network-based model if you make a lot of assumptions about symmetries and regularities in the network. And those symmetries and regularities sort of take the form of taking this network and turning it into a stirred tank reactor where everything is just interacting with everything else. Um, and what you get out of that are some sort of dynamical equations of state. Here's one, oops, I meant to change this. Here's one for an for a, uh, infectious disease epidemic model. But it could represent almost anything. The, the e, these things represent concentrations of different quantities in that tank. This is an interaction between two of the two of the things, and it's a parameterized interaction, just like we had before. Um, the reaction diffusion models they they uh, may emphasize the the network structure a little bit more than the stirred tank reactor does. Um, and in, in the world of infectious disease epidemiology, what we do is we start with an infection somewhere, we, we take a subgraph out of that whole interaction network and say, well, 
according to the subgraph, if you infected this node, it would infect these and then those and those with some sort of probability. And it, it reproduces the kind of dynamics that you expect to see in a reaction diffusion system. However, it generally assumes a fixed network. Um, sometimes these models are called equation-free. I think that's something of a misnomer because there are certainly equations in the model telling you exactly what the probability is of each of these transmissions. What they don't have is, a, is an equation of state that says, at equilibrium, this is what the solution is going to look like. And uh, you, you're not going to get an equation of state with an agent-based model either. So uh, just be aware that when someone says a model is equation-free, it may be somebody from one of these camps trying to cast aspersions on the other camp. Um, so agent-based models, like I said, we, they emphasize the individual interactions. They assume an interaction network, but it's an interaction network that evolves with time, changes with time. Um, and we can only simulate a few instances, uh, a few, pick a few samples out of this huge probability space. And the results we get are things like like this. I should have said, I guess, when I showed the movie the first time, that these are, uh, I believe these are dead cells that are being colored so that you can see at the, at the end of the interaction, this is where you might have a lesion, for example, in the system, in the, in the simulation. And the different volumes are the different different things that we represent in the system. So there's now an appropriate uh, the lymph nodes. So there's all, there, there are these different models. They have different characteristics. They focus on different things. They make different assumptions. And therefore, they're, each one's appropriate for a different question. Um, and I don't know how much interaction you have with NIH, but I'm just going to show you a model of the NIH. Actually, a set of models of the NIH. They're all different. They focus on different things. And they're appropriate for different questions. So here's the NIH. There's a campus map of the NIH. There's the NIH's web page that tells you what kind of research is going on. There's a list of publications that have been NIH funded. There's a, a list of projects that are NIH funded. They're all representations of NIH. But they're all models of the NIH and what it does. But they're very different things. They're focusing on different things and the results you expect to get out of them are different. So here we... When a modeler gives a talk, there's always a point where they put up some quote from a famous modeler that explains why everything they're doing is okay. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I like to get, I like to get the, the question represented exactly in my system, and then figure out the best way to get an approximate answer to it. Because um, if you if you just are representing the wrong question, no matter how well you do, you, you can't control how well you've approximated the answer to the right question. So, if one of these models is going to be appropriate to your question, you need a way to figure out which model it is that's appropriate. So here are some rules of thumb developed over uh, the course of a, a lot of work in modeling. Um, so first of all, is, is the interaction network, is it random or structured? Right? If, if you're in a uh, chemical tank reactor, <coughs> the interactions are random. They're, that's what the stirrer is for. But I would say that it doesn't really represent the human body very well. Um, so I would say that this is highly structured, that's highly structured, and that's highly structured. So some of the assumptions that go into, into this kind of thing just do not hold in these places. Um, are the interactions nonlinear? Okay, this is something that I was that I alluded to sort of before. So here's here's the state of all the things in the in the system. And here's some function that's going to represent the dynamics of the system. And that function is definitely going to be nonlinear if the in individual interactions are nonlinear. If it's a nonlinear function, then you can't move it inside that summation. Right? So if uh, and I'll have another example of this later as well. So the, the point is that if the interactions are nonlinear, you can't start by taking the mean of the states of the system and then applying the function and expect to get anything that makes sense out the end. 
because uh, because the mean is a it's exactly one of these summations, and you can't move that function through the summation. So the dynamics of the of the mean are very different from the mean of the dynamics. That's all I'm trying to say. If that's the case, then you shouldn't start by a representation of the system that's just the mean of, of the system. Um, so, what outcomes are actually distinguished in your model? Uh, and, and the things you want to look at and the things that you have available to look at. So, for example, if your model You've got this beautiful detailed model of every single interaction in the entire system, and it's so complicated that you can only represent a tiny little spatial extent of the system. Then maybe all this structure is going to be completely transparent to you, to your model. If, if all you can represent in space, say, is one of these structures, then it doesn't matter to you that the, the whole system itself is structured. It's, it's just like make a, little, a model of that little uh, piece of tissue. So, these are, this is a trade-off you have to take into account. If, if you make the model too complicated, you can't model very much. If you make it too simple, you can model a lot, but then it's not, it's not going to capture all the dynamics that you need. Um, how about the questions you're looking at? So the, the movie I've been showing you is attempting to answer a question about formation of lesions. And if you've got a lesion here, it's there, and it's not over here, and it's this size, and it's not, it's not generally sort of smeared out over the whole section of, of uh, colon or intestine. It's, it's in a place. If lesion formation is not what you're looking at, though, if you just want to do blood samples and find out what's the concentration of some chemical or uh, some cell in the blood, then you don't care about the spatial aspects of the lesion formation very much. So it would be kind of silly in order to answer this question to make a hugely complex model that's difficult to, to calibrate. How about the observables? I think this is really cool. I, it, it was obviously a possibility, but it never really dawned on me until we started doing this work. Uh, how this relationship between the observables and the simulations might work out. So I've got a time course, uh, an experiment in which we sacrifice animals on certain days, and we observe some quantity here called the observable. Uh, maybe it's the, the, actually I don't know, I'm not going to say what it is. It's, a, it's an observable that we get from sacrificing animals at discrete time points. And we have a model that's just a wonderful model that goes right through all the data. Absolutely uh, nothing you'll ever see in the, in the literature. And everything's hunky-dory, right? Except there's this little problem that there's another model that goes right through all the data and is equally explanatory. And this, this happened to us. So, one point of view might be, well, this is all the data we have, so you just can't distinguish these models. There's no point in making this more complicated thing that bounces all over the place. But that's not the right point. That's not the right lesson to take away from this. The lesson to take away from this is that you need some new observables. You, this, is, this is a case of the opposite direction in that experiment and modeling group, in which the model says, you really need to go back into the lab and sacrifice some animals here, and maybe there, and try to distinguish between these two very different scenarios of what's going on. So the, the modeling is driving the experiment. The experiment is helping you calibrate the models. And the, the, the modeling can suggest experiments that you might not have thought of doing otherwise. Um, so it's, one of the most obvious aspects of the agent-based models is that it's, it's a discrete model. There are things that are not concentrations that are smeared over space and time. There are things in there. And is it important to represent that discreteness? And this is going to go back to that question of whether the interactions are nonlinear. In a biological system, you expect something, things to grow exponentially. It's kind of a default way that growth happens. So suppose now that I have, that I'm interested in the concentration of some kind of T cell. If I represent it as a continuous variable, 
the, the, that concentration can be as close to zero as I want. If I represent it as a discrete set of cells, either a cell's there or it's not. So, um, if I have, if I don't have a cell there at all, no matter how much exponential growth goes on, I'm never going to get a cell there. If I do have a cell, it's going to grow exponentially and turn into a big population of cells very quickly. What I was trying to say earlier was, if I had this situation where 90% of the time there's no cell there at all, and 10% of the time there's one cell there, it's not going to work very well if I represent that as uh, x equals 0.1 concentration. The, the mean value of this scenario is not going to be that uh, the same as taking the mean value of the initial condition and letting it dynamically evolve. Because if I do it this way, 90% of the time I'll end up with zero after any, any amount of time. And here I'll end up with some exponentially growing quantity. And the mean of those two things is not going to be the same as uh, this growing at the rate of, at the same rate, exponentially. Um, lastly, is randomness important? And this isn't technically going to distinguish which model you use, because you can introduce randomness into any of these kinds of models. However, this is where I get on, on my particular agent-based modeling kit. It's a lot easier in an agent-based model to start throwing dice than it is to really understand what it takes to integrate stochastic differential equations properly, especially if there are complications like uh, delays and uh, spatial par partial derivatives instead of ordinary different differential equations. So one of the things that's nice about agent-based models is that you can show the assumptions you're making to anybody and they, they can understand that. They may be very complicated interaction diagrams, but you can understand what's going on in the system. You can pick it apart piece by piece. So, um, oops, right. so to, to sum up that little discussion, uh, you, it's easy to think that somebody who's building an agent-based model is trying to, to build exact replica of the bigger world in a computer. But that's not really what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the interactions that are most important and the assumptions that are most important in making a model that represents what's going on in the real world. Because if we tried to do this, it would just be completely infeasible. It would, it would make too complicated a model and it would make too complicated a, a set of outcomes. So what we want is something like this and the outcome, even though often the way to get to something like that is to break it down into individual pieces and then aggregate back up at the end. So this is my summary. This is what you, you can't, I don't know, maybe this, maybe the biologists don't have this, but uh, in physics we always talk about the spherical cow. Um, <laughs> In, in my case, in fact, it was a, a problem. It was a spherical, it was a spherical uh, pigeon, or a, yeah, pigeon, I think. Uh, the problem at the back of the chapter was, what's the terminal velocity of a pigeon? And we sat there and stared at it. I don't think anybody solved it until we got to class. And this, the first step of the solution was, assume a spherical pigeon. <laughs> Once you do that, it's very easy to get the terminal velocity of a pigeon. Um, and what I, I like this, this is actually uh, taken from something a colleague of mine said about other kinds of models. You don't want to make stupid assumptions, but you do want to make assumptions and simplifications that are realistic, that reflect your understanding of the system, and uh, that, that help you solve it. They shouldn't just be based on what's easy to solve. You, you don't want uh, you don't want the exact solution to the wrong problem. You want a reasonable solution to the problem that you've got. So that's what you don't get. Um, you, you also don't get uh, some path solutions. This stuff, it, it sounds easy. It hasn't really been done. Um, it's, 
lots of different groups are nibbling at the edges of this problem. And uh, I think our group has made a lot of progress on it. But we don't, we don't have the, the turnkey system yet. Um, and finally, like I said, once we've got all this under control, then we start layering the systems together. So here we have a, an idea of a, what a multi-scale model might look like, uh, going from tissues through cells through um, chemokines to uh, within the cell. And I think we're talking about each one of these parts this week. And we have some ideas about how to put them together that we'll talk about in the, uh, in the panel discussion on Thursday. And there's nothing that says you have to use the same kind of modeling technology for each of these layers when you put them together. We're, we're experimenting to see how easy it is to, to make the different layers match up and how they work. Um, that's almost it. I'm going to add one more set of comments without any kind of fancy picture. This kind of work really can't go on in isolation in any one discipline. So we've got physicists, chemists, mathematicians, computer scientists, uh, and each of them has, has worked on problems that are similar in different settings. And they all have different kinds of insights that they contribute to things. I mentioned that computer scientists can count things. They can tell you how complicated the problem that you, the model you just set up is uh, in ways that, that other disciplines aren't so necessarily so interested in. Physicists can tell you a lot about the, the impacts of nonlinear interactions on, on overall dynamics. Um, so each, each domain has its own perspective to bring. And it's important to, to build teams that can each contribute to the model in different ways and can ensure that overall the things represent the reality of the thing. Okay, and I still have five or six minutes, so I can answer some questions. I don't know if I'm jumping the gun for the round table, seeing what else goes on in the week, but I've been wondering, we're talking about the sweetness and the sweet states. And yesterday we had a big talk about plasticity and how cells can migrate between different states. And what molecules are we able to create this compromise if you have the sweet states, but they're not finite like we discussed today? So then go, let's say that we just didn't shift from M1 to M2 or pieces of no trick right back and forth. Okay, so I, I need to repeat the question for the mic, I think. Uh, so we have the question is how do you how do you combine discrete states with the kind of plasticity that's that lets you move between the discrete states? <coughs> and I should have I should have mentioned that. Um, just like you can build an, a noun phrase out of a noun, some adjectives and stuff, there's, there's not a clear-cut distinction between states and things. So I might, for example, have a macrophage that can either be type 1 or type 2 as a state, or I might have a type 1 macrophage and a type 2 macrophage as different things. And I haven't thought a lot about it, but I think that's probably the answer to your, pro your question. That instead of having each discrete kind of cell be an entity, that you have one overarching cell and it is, has a sort of parameter in it that sets whether it's more like this or more like that. So for example, um, instead of having a cell that predominantly secretes IL-17 and one that does IL-10, you could have a cell that secretes IL and you could actually parameterize it to be making some fraction of 17 and some fraction of 10. At least that's what my first solution would be. Yeah? Uh, kind of building on to this question. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you talk from the perspective of multi-scale modeling, so there are these cell-cell interactions with, say, I want to use an agent-based model to use that to model that cellular behavior. And then I want to scale up and use that information from the cellular behavior and kind of want to go on a more higher on, the, on, a, on a higher scale. I want to use differential equations to model the system, like the interactions between bigger networks, so to say. 
So what are the caveats in that process? Like what are the things that one should keep in mind for you know, helping from one level to the other? So the, the question is, what are the caveats in taking a representation at one scale and inserting it into a different scale? It's kind of a hybrid feature like modeling with yeah. the agent based simulations and all the things, so to say. I think the, the biggest caveat in my mind is not trying to take the entire model that you've got at one scale and insist that it be represented the same way in the next scale. So you may have a very uh, may have a model of cell differentiation that is very dynamic and tells you very clearly what the time force is for a particular cell. If then you put that into a cell uh, into a model that deals mostly with uh, interaction or with the tissue level, say, at that point, it's completely reasonable to to take the cell the outcomes of the cell differentiation model and and use them in a, to represent populations of cells in the tissue. You wouldn't want to represent every single cell in the tissue probably and, and in gory detail calculate exactly how it's going to differentiate. But you could take small populations of cells and and use your differentiation model to figure out how they're going to uh, what their dynamics is going to look like. And that, so that's so the biggest caveat in my mind is not to not to try to keep the same level of detail at every scale because it's not feasible. And then, in fact, that's that is the that's the problem that you have to solve when you go yeah. into multi-scale models. So, in more depth than that, I I don't know what I can say. I, we can try to address it in the panel on Thursday.